said. We will also look to, at the ratio of operational money that goes into programming versus salaries and administrative. So if your program is 80-20 and it's 80% salaries and 20% programming, we're going to look really hard at that. That's not, we want to see the reverse ratio. Now, that brings us to the other component. Does it affect a regional or Alexandria-wide concern? So if you had a 50-50 situation, operations to programming, but it had a huge impact citywide, perhaps we relax that fraction, that 80-20 that we're looking for. In general, you like to see 80-20, and that means 80% programming, 20% uh, looking at other things. Uh, churches, I use that as, as an example because churches have a lot of wonderful programs. There's federal legislation for faith-based initiatives that have freed up a lot of what we can do with public money in churches. But it has, there are certain criteria that go into it. Uh, it cannot be about promoting one particular religion. It has to be about an initiative like an after-school program, a tutor program. Now, you could be creative. There are things that we all think are universal, uh, cri universal things we believe in, uh, you know, bravery, honesty, courage, those things. Those can all be part of a program that's civic-minded and yet not uh, put us in danger of losing funding because of violating any kind of separation of church and state issues. So, again, that is going to be happening soon. We hope to have that at Coughlin Saunders, like we had the uh, Energy and Sustainability Summit. Uh, I think we're going to have a lot of players come to that. We'll be able to outline the, the, these programs and really help you learn how to partner with the city. Uh, we also, in conjunction with that, would like to have a summit with the local mayors. This is something Clarence and I have talked about in the past. Uh, we talked about holding off because of some of the tax reallocation issues. I'm going to again re-engage uh, Mayor Fields to, to join and partner with me on it. The idea here is the local mayors as executives have certain issues, so the councilmen, we would invite them. But we want to make sure that we have something where we're really getting what is going on out there in funding our infrastructure. And I've got to tell all of you again, that model has changed in 50 years. Uh, our smaller townships and villages uh, are suffering very, very seriously in terms of funding infrastructure. The provision of basic services. As the city that enjoys a tax base that is created by all of us, we have to be mindful of what we can do to help. And so we want to consider that as we move through the SPARC issues. Uh, speaking of SPARC, we will be coming out this week with uh, a what I would call a reverse RFP for lack of a better term now. We'll come up with a term later for it, but uh, really it's about showing a skeletal uh, outline of what we'd like to see developers respond to. So the first one we plan to start with is Spark CRA1. That's, remember, Cultural Restoration Area. And the first one will be this riverfront area, that, that sort of wide view that Herbert Dixon had outlined uh, that goes from around Ocala, but really even the port would be included, right, Bill? We kind of would come all the way down inside of I-49 and track all the way really past Willow Glen at this point. Now, we're not talking about a taxing district or anything. I want to make sure this is the CRA district, but it corresponds to that same general area that, we, that Mr. Dixon had uh, in his proposed bill uh, last year. So that's kind of the CR, CRA1 area. Uh, the next one we probably will go to is going to be in Mr. Marshall's district. That would be the area of uh, North MacArthur Drive from, say, Rapids down to Bolton and down to, say, Elliott Street, maybe a little beyond that, uh, and some of the areas in between or, or, and or that are covered by that. So this reverse RFP will ask developers to respond to us with what they see as a vision for the whole corridor. We're not talking about looking at just one specific project. We're asking people to give us a vision for the corridor. We hope to vet those ideas, put them through a process with the SPARC Commission, whether that be the council itself or whether there is a choice to appoint an actual commission. I favor a commission and we'll be glad at the Q&A on your part to answer any questions about why I do. Uh, that's kind of the next move with Spark. And remember, September 19th or 20th, what is it, David? The money, when does the money hit the bank, so to speak? September 10th. I'm sorry, September 10th, uh, these bond funds are going to be coming in. We have to be very careful as a city 
that we really look at adhering to a plan that is vetted, gone through, and serves our citizens best. If we put the money in the bank and it becomes just another form of the uh, capital budget, we're, that, those aren't going to be good things for us. And I would encourage folks to talk to their councilman about that and really put the pressure on all of us to have a formulated plan. We have those spin down requirements. It means you've got to spend within a certain amount of time. We really need to get on this right now. Um, let's see. Uh, Bentley. Um, the Bentley is, uh, from a personal standpoint, moving along better in terms of the communication than I've experienced in the last two years. That's not to say that a lot of folks haven't been working hard. That's to say that I think we're, we're getting somewhere in terms of looking at this whole area, even included within how SPAR can address it. Uh, there is a focus by Dudley Ventures, and they have put this in writing to me, that they understand and they concur in the belief that three properties, the Bentley, the former Holiday Inn, and the Riverfront Center must be considered together. That they agree that as a primary consideration, we should do that if we can. Now, again, the purpose of these meetings is so we can get all the information. It's hard for any one of you to get it all in, in one article, and we understand that. Uh, nothing is in stone at this point, but I'm glad to see that we're looking at all three of those assets together, because I think that's what it's going to take to make it work. Um, whether it's mixed use, whether it's straight hotel models, we're not at that point yet. We do think time is of the essence, and, and the reason for that is there are certain tax credits they'd like to use, namely new market tax credits and other historical tax credits that we have some concern uh, will not be reallocated. After a certain amount of time, you just you, they're not available anymore. And we need to make sure that if we're wanting to move it from its current ownership, that we consider how can we do that and maybe have the city hold out before it decides how to do the public-private partnering, but these guys want to get that ownership changed. And so that's kind of our rub right now. It's, it's a tough position to be in in a way, but in a way the, the communication has opened up a lot of new doors. So that's sort of where we are on the Bentley. Uh, we all think it's an important asset. Uh, uh, there's been a lot of disagreement about how to make it come back into commerce. Is it a publicly subsidized hotel? Is it a publicly subs subsidized mixed-use model? Is it a private model that then we look at infrastructure to build around it that allows it to move up and be better in a model with, with other assets? Those are the things that we're working on. Um, I expect that this week uh, we will put out part one of a two-part, possibly three-part series of papers on the Bentley and the other assets. I also expect that I will send a letter to Dudley Ventures outlining some of these things in detail, and I will make that available to you uh, without any need for a request. I will send it to all of you uh, the minute it is signed and goes out. And that's what I have for right now. I will be glad to answer any questions. The only thing I didn't really cover was the status of, I think, some of the reorganization. Uh, I believe that the reorganization with uh, Ms. Seastrunk's uh, uh, confirmation last night and the introduction without any issue of those budgetary matters. I think that we, and you have the report, RT, and I know Sherry does too, we've gone through this exhaustively compared us to other cities. We don't believe there's any duplication. We think we've shown it. And I think the council was satisfied with that uh, after yesterday. It took a lot of working through to get there, uh, and that's to be expected, and, and hopefully we'll learn and do it a better way next time. So I do expect that uh, we'll be looking at HR. I'm not going to comment on the personnel aspects of it at this point because I think that that's not appropriate and probably carries with it some legal uh, consequences. But I will say that uh, you can expect to hear from us about how we're going to handle uh, that other position uh, very shortly. And I'll answer questions you have specifically about it. I have uh, a question. Go ahead, Chair. Um, I understand that, and this is about the reorganization, I understand, specifically HR, that the process started in December. The recruitment <coughs> maybe started that far back for this um, position. Can you take me along the steps along the way and how did we actually get to this position if it was all good then um, and we actually hired somebody, got them on staff, 
uh, how did we actually get here? You know, okay. were there red flags? You know. Okay. Uh, it's a good question, a tough question because of some legal issues. As you know, as a public body, uh, Sherry, we, there are some constraints we have in commenting on people who apply for job and their personnel records because we're public. But this has already been out there. Right, so. and I'm going to cover the things that are out there. Uh, we opened up uh, and started, I think, advertising. Did we advertise? To for HRK, we advertise for HR. I have a committee in place that has four members, uh, Ms. McGills, Mr. Crutchfield, Ms. Harris, and Mr. Johnson. So that's the uh, finance director, uh, the city attorney, the chief of operations, and Lisa in either the chief of policy role or just as a senior staff member. We've included Lisa. Uh, all of these folks that applied were interviewed by this uh, group of folks, not by me. Um, with regard to HR, this is a, I guess a long time coming, Sherry, in the sense that HR and civil service in Alexandria have had their share of problems, and I think all of us know that who've been city hall watchers for years and years. Uh, there are different issues that have arisen over time. Uh, in fact, before this administration, there was a lawsuit that led to the split or severing of those two divisions, or the, the creation of two divisions from what was once one division. So now there's a personnel director who by law answers to the civil service board, and that is Pam Siraj. She does not answer to the city. Her direction is taken from the civil service board. And I think people don't necessarily realize that. You have to think of the city staff in two parts, classified and unclassified. Unclassified are people like the city attorney, uh, Mr. Crutchfield, Ms. Harris, uh, now Ms. Seastrom, whom I appoint directly and who require council confirmation. They're unclassified. They have no protection. They're at-will employees. They serve at the pleasure of the mayor, even after they're confirmed. The classified staff, which is the bulk of our employees, there are almost 900 folks that work for the city, uh, a little bit less than that. The bulk of those people, of course, are classified. So they're appointed through a civil service process, and then I pick usually from three names. Sometimes it's one, sometimes two, but, but three names, and, and I get to pick those. That does not go through council. That's something that the mayor picks through civil service. The charter has certain requirements. The state legislature has certain pieces, and there's been a lot of friction. So that brings us to now. We moved through what had been put into place by the previous administration and council, getting us through that lawsuit, setting up this new paradigm within which to work, and we now made some decisions about how we would change uh, personnel there. I felt that uh, uh, the creation of this position that addresses, I think, community outreach, spark, diversity, and those things was important. Uh, Mr. Page was the only pick that I had in mind. That was not a, a process that uh, people applied for, but the division directors we feel should be applied for. Uh, Mr. Foster and several others applied for the job. Uh, in terms of a resume, uh, interview, uh, uh, paper credentials, Sherry, uh, Greg won out in the committee's mind. They made a unanimous suggestion to me that he be put forth. Uh, I didn't interview him, only they did. Uh, I, hadn't, I hadn't met him before, and uh, that's how he arrived uh, as our nominee. Um, now, I'll carefully go through this. I am aware that there are many things in the community uh, on the internet and coffee shop talk, if you will, and other things that are going on. I can only tell you that we investigate our nominees fully and that in those investigations, uh, if we came across something that raised our interest, we would react to that. And certainly in that particular position, Sherry, you'd have to really think hard about it because that person's going to be in charge of employees, uh, really <clears throat> fully. Um, and th there's, there's nothing that we can point to there. And that's probably as far as I can go because I don't want to in any way insinuate the validity of anything that's being said or put on internet or blog sites for, for that matter. But if you ask me a specific question, I'll try to, I'll try to move through it. Does that answer how well, we got here? It, it, I guess I don't get 
why are we in the position today that we had one, we don't, I mean, we okay. had the position field, we don't have it, you know, if everything was good, was all, were all the ducks in a row, were all the procedures followed, how do we get to, we no longer have Mr. Foster in that position. Okay. Mr. Foster was never in the position. I need to make that clear. I understand your question now. Mr. Foster, it was anticipated because he was brought down and, and met uh, the council members. Uh, before any type of uh, issues arose, Mr. Foster was placed on our staff under an existing line item, which we can legally do and have done and will do again if, if we need to. That was to bring a person on who would be training for a job where a lot was going on. We were working through all those issues. Uh, we felt it was necessary to have a person train with the existing staff. And to be honest, we don't think that that should be a free thing. Mr. Foster uh, has to make a living, so he was put on that way. Uh, that was a decision made by the committee. Uh, I didn't know fully about it when it was made, but I stand by them. They did inform me that this was what they were going to do. It was probably a little bit of miscommunication there. Uh, I, I'll accept responsibility for that uh, because I have to. The buck stops with me no matter what anyway. Um, we would do it again in certain cases. Uh, I'm, I'm a little bit unsure about, I know that some of the council members expressed why did this happen. We didn't know. Really, it wasn't something that we have to go say. And I felt they did know that Mr. Foster was coming to every meeting. He was doing things constantly up here. Uh, and I want the, the listeners to and the watchers to remember when uh, Chuck Johnson came on board, uh, I left Kelvin purposefully in the position of city attorney for a, a good while to make that transition. And in fact, we brought Mr. Johnson on as a paid employee before he was confirmed. Now. That was done by contract, which the council had to vote on, because they have to ratify all contracts with the city. But the reason that was done that way, and we didn't bring him on as just an employee under an existing line item, was because as an attorney, uh, he, he, he has to be all assistant city attorneys by the charter have to be by contract. So that was the only difference. Um, I, I think I understand fully the, the question, Sherry, is what has changed right now? And that is something I can't answer other than we have to continue to investigate any nominees. We have to investigate anything, even if it's just rumor. If it's serious enough, we have an obligation to investigate. Uh, and then number two, and this is the most important and I think directly responsive to your question, I didn't feel at that point, and neither did the recommending staff members, that it was fair to group two people together when Janice had, was, that job was kind of the first one in it. We felt like we needed to go ahead and sever those positions and move forward on them one at a time. If you look at our staff material we provided, we have shown that really the only new position was the diversity officer. All the other positions were an existing line item, so we don't think there was there's no issue of excessive spending. The budget process had already covered these items. In fact, having not filled them for that amount of time, the money wasn't spent for that amount of time. So the notion that it was excessive, I just disagree with. And I'll leave it at that. This is not a time for political statements. This is about answering your question. So we feel like we were certainly within our right to do it, and it's, it's not excessive spending. This is the same approved plan that really we trotted out December 19th of 06. That's some two weeks after I was sworn in. So this stuff has been out there for, for a long time. Uh, and I hope that answers it, Sherry. I know you want to know a direct answer to well, tell me why he wasn't confirmed, and I can only say no, I can't I mean, answer you that. You just brought up um, he wasn't thoroughly investigated. Um, so you're saying now that there's some uncertainty that you have to go back and no, I, I said he was. That's not what I said. Okay, I said he was thoroughly investigated. And as a matter of fact, uh, everything in the investigation of him, which covers a pretty wide variety of things, indicates nothing that would have you not bring someone on board. Again, on, on paper and by his interviews and what I consider his uh, intellect, his ability to do this job, there, there aren't any questions about Mr. Foster. Uh, that's where we are right now. That can happen in, it, it's kind of, it's not in the vacuum, it's the opposite. That can happen with us interviewing and doing this. 
but that doesn't stop other folks from saying that there are other issues you need to look at. That doesn't stop people from saying there are possible other HR folks that would like to apply for this that didn't. But you've got to cut them off somewhere. We can't just reopen it every time someone else decides they want to apply. Uh, but I do feel an obligation, Sherry, to look at even rumors if they're serious enough. Uh, I know people can write things on the blog without much, you know, it's anonymous, you can say pretty much whatever you want. Uh, I get reports of some interesting things about me and, and folks that I know that, you know, they're, they're, they're silly in a way, but something about this, uh, hiring a person of, of this magnitude in terms of what they affect in the city, you, you have to go through that. Uh, and they're not silly statements, they're serious allegations and so we have to look at all of those things. And, and I think we will. I feel obligated to do it, Sherry. I feel like I'm on notice of issues that if I didn't do something, uh, I, I would not be doing my job. It's the easiest way I can say it. Thank you. You're welcome. And Mr. Foster remains currently on the city staff. No. Uh, once, once it was determined that that confirmation wasn't going to go through, and this was kind of really where there was more of a miscommunication, I immediately said, pull him off. There's no reason to pay somebody at this point if we don't know if there's going to be confirmation. I believe he stayed on a few uh, extra days because there was kind of a miscommunication with me and the, and the four uh, on our internal personnel committee. Um, so I think at this point, David, is it is that right? He is, he's not on staff at this point. When was um, he taken off? <clears throat> is there an exact date? <clears throat> Friday is the effective day this past Friday. This past Friday, oh, thank you. Everybody? Okay, um, you were saying earlier about the, um, the Dudley Ventures considering all three properties. Would you say you would almost force them to go into that if they were to make a plan with the city or kind of leaving it open? L leaving it open. Uh, you know, it's it's a it's a strange world. The, the public-private world has uh, certainly some rules, and, and that has developed over the years. Where there's a lot more models of how to do it appropriately. In fact, upstairs, uh, Patrick Moore sent a model of public-private partnering, which really looks a lot like the model we're going through with Spark. Um, no, I don't want to force them to do anything. I, in fact, their expertise is out there in creating. I'd like for them to help us work through this, and I think that uh, the caliber of folks involved at Dudley uh, are able to do that. I think that when you see this part one of these papers, you'll see that your staff here at the city, that your tax dollars pay for, that we've been very diligent and serious and have done heavy research into industry uh, concerns. And, and those concerns are simple. Uh, hotels, the convention business, there are concerns nationwide. They are not about Alexandria, they're about our whole country and where things are going. And so I think that we have to be careful in what we use your dollars to subsidize. And I use that word in the broadest sense. It doesn't mean one thing, it can mean anything from uh, helping with infrastructure to something uh, uh, that has to do with tax abatement, anything like that, I'm counting as a subsidy. Uh, and I want to remind you a related issue. We have an ownership interest in the former Holiday Inn. We have an obligation first, we believe, to address that. And I think Dudley came on and said, we agree with you on that. That, that is, if the public owns part of the Holiday Inn, a substantial part, uh, then we have an obligation to figure out where that asset is before we go and do something with the Bentley. The Bentley has had a storied past, but it's had a lot of cyclic up and down, and then, you know, it kind of follows the, the tax credits. When they kind of run, the Bentley's gone down. Guys, I want to make sure that whatever happens to the Bentley, we're not having this discussion in four or seven more years. The new market tax credits actually take seven years. That's a good thing. That means whoever's getting the benefit of those tax credits had better make it work for at least seven years or they don't get the credit. We ca That's kind of a good thing. RT, I know you're, you're catching that. It's So that's that's getting us in a better place, but... I mean, don't we all want to see it if a public-private partnership that involves even public entities in it could anchor this thing for good, where we don't have to worry about this anymore? That's what we're really shooting for. I don't think we have the, all the answers here. I think that you've got a good staff that are trying to go through those 
vet those issues, and I think that Dudley is as good a player out there to try to work with to do that. That's where I think we are. Is there a fear? Because as of right now, no real businesses besides Centrix and people associated with Centrix have been able to or have looked at the venues as far as most people know. Is there a fear that it's just maybe not viable? That the project the itself yes. isn't? RT, I would say uh, that's a very straightforward question. It deserves a straightforward answer. Yes. There are a lot of folks who feel that the business plan itself, at least those that have come forth so far, have not been viable. Um, I, I think that we've sort of switched gears from the staff standpoint. It's hard for us to get in and make the assessment share on, their, on an entire business plan. Let me say this. If you base it on their occupancy rate and their ADR, it is viable. It works under the numbers, but it leaves a gap in financing. It's this simple. If you imagine a Bentley on a, at the top of a, a chain of credits, it's $20 million. This is what the project is right now. It's $20 million. And as you move down that chain, when you get to the bottom, RT, there's what we call a gap in financing. And that gap, in this case, is somewhere between $3.1 and $2.5 million. So you have some critics who say, if the purchase price is too high, and it's roughly that gap, changing the purchase price gets you the deal and makes it viable with no public subsidy. That's going to be one side of it. The critics of that criticism are going to say, well, Mr. Mayor, who, who cares? If you can't get it, if, if the, the seller is going to hold at that price no matter what and lock up a piece of property forever, what happens? We've got to identify this gap. So what Mr. Dixon had proposed was if you do a TIF, you've TIFs are known, they're for gap financing. You finance the gap through the TIF. Uh, our question is, what do you get on the back end to do that? TIFs allow the money up front. We like the model more, let's see your business plan work. We'll put in uh, that we can help on the back end, but let's see your business plan work a few years. Let's look at how we identify uh, bringing some private folks who have in the past not considered it viable to the table. And RT, the way we've kind of looked at the potential for proposing that is this. If we can have significant public assets being built up around the Bentley, the Riverfront Center, the Holiday Inn, parking structures, other things we know they need, will that attract private folks to come in and fill this gap without the need for your direct public tax dollars going into what we consider at the end of the day to be a private deal. Now, I can't see Melinda behind you, but I'm sure she's wincing a little. And the reason she may be wincing a little is, even though it's a commercial deal, there's an historic preservation aspect. And it is considered very standard nationwide that public monies do become involved in preserving our history, our past. It gives us a cultural identity. It makes people want to invest. If you get rid of every asset, Melinda, in the whole city that has our identity, people tend, here's the stats, they tend not to invest in those areas. It's just plain and simple. So there's a business model, not just an emotional model that we have to think about. But that's really the issues with the Bentley deal in a nutshell. We have to figure out, RT, where 2.5 to 3.1 million are going to come from. I believe Dudley is perfectly capable of providing that. They're pretty big time. But what they want from me is, okay, Jacques, we're perfectly capable of providing it, but what are you going to do to help ensure that this partnership will exist in the future? If we're going to invest or we're going to take it out of ownership now, what, are you, what is the city instead of me? It's, what is the city, all of us? What will the citizens do to ensure the viability of this model in the future? And that's where we are in the discussion. And we are wide open to suggestions uh, from any of you and from any of the public. Well, I do have another question. Yes, ma'am. And it's, it's back to staffing because that's the big elephant in the that's room fine. this morning. Um, in the paper um, the other day, there was a list of people that were named um, who were Previously, there was some conversation about duplication of services, yes. and that was there was a list of names that talked about. Okay, these people probably, um, I guess, if if you could, if you had to let somebody go, if you if there was some duplication in services, um, here it is. 
Is, is, am I reading that right? There was a list. And, and the reason why is because in that list, Joe Page was in that list right. um, and that position. And also, um, Vaughn Jennings was in that list. And, and I was on the assumption that what she was doing, particularly when it came to bringing uh, people to the table as far as uh, providing city services, um, the RFPs and things of that nature, that that was a big, it is a big deal. A big deal. So now I was really shocked to see. I think you'll like my answer to this. Right? I want to hear. My answer to it is the town talk got it wrong, plain and simple. So uh, you uh, wait a minute, wait a minute. I didn't write it. Oh, RT didn't that's, write that's okay, but that's a big wrong, and uh, I never, and I didn't see a, and a correction. So I, I kept looking for a correction. I didn't see it. I, I think was there a correction? Do it. No. Do not know. Um, Sherry, we. Uh, We've sent a lot of correction requests into the town talk over the past year. Uh, a lot of them were happening at one point. Then it started being, you know, kind of uh, uh, parsing everything. Well, couldn't you have meant that if we took it that way? And so yeah, that's a big. Uh, a lot. So this is what we did. We started recording those interviews uh, because we wanted to make sure, and that's part of why we're here today to have all the media present to make sure that articles are getting a fair shake across the board. Uh, there was, n I don't know where the statement those three jobs were going went to. I would ask you to go back and watch Channel 4 and tell me if you can glean that from my conversation on Channel 4. So you picked the names out of the hat, these names? No, the names were discussed, but they weren't discussed as being lost. Mr. Loss and I were having a uh, discussion about Duplication. I was. I had taken the position. There's no duplication. Read the job uh, descriptions for each person, and you'll see that Miss Jennings and the proposal for Mr. Page are very different jobs. Uh, the only question of duplication that we discussed was whether the EEO coordinator was a job that better belong somewhere else. That's the conversation Mr. Lawson and I had. And I pointed that out, that we really were already fixing that. So I think what happened was, I think this is how the whole duplication deal happened, Sherry. I think that Myron and some of the other guys rightfully were looking at this plan and they honed in on three people. And they said, okay, of these three people, are there any overlap or duplication what they provide? Uh, they didn't have the benefit of knowing that on February 7th and 8th, when we had our retreat, we had already identified that EEO, as a coordinator, mayoral assistant, needed to move back into HR where it belonged. I believe that that position was created out of some uh, uh, tragic moments in the city, and to handle through those situations, I'm not going to say politically, but to make sure that the public was aware the city was addressing them, this position was created out front and stood out. Uh, I think you know, Sherry, that EEO is a function of HR and belongs in HR. I think Joe would say that or anyone else. So instead so, of it being a separate entity, it just goes up under... Uh, it goes back into HR. HR with a super department head uh, over it. With a, depart with a division head over it in a line item that would have existed anyway. Again, why I keep telling everybody we're not changing the budget, it would go back where it should have been and can exist anyway. And one of the things you can do is, uh, if you beef up that staff and have the things working right, is you can avoid having to fill an assistant HR director, which is a pretty expensive job to have. Uh, we haven't decided that, so I don't wanna, I, I'm, I always try to make clear what we're saying, this is what we're doing and we're thinking through it. This is one of those things we're thinking through. But that was how we envisioned it coming out of the retreat. So again, it's really a straightforward situation and answer, Sherry. What the town talk reported in that article, I think the statement was Roy admits, first of all, from the title down, I disagree with the article. I'll just leave it at that. Uh, we don't admit and did not admit then there was duplication. We admitted that I understand how the council can arrive at questions about that, and that's what we work through. Uh, I, I don't think that there was a, a, uh, uh, an admission by us that there was duplication. I can tell you where on the two tapes, to the seconds, where to go look, and I think if you go give it a fair review, you'll see uh, what we were stating. Good, good question. I'm glad you asked it. Um, if we can, stay on staffing. Um, since I've been on the beat three days. Uh, as far as duplication, I mean, 
Going back to the city retreat, EO, as you just said, was probably the only one or one of the glaring ones that really came out as far as any possible implication. Is, is that a correct statement? Um, I, I'm not sure if I fully understand. I can go through and just let you know that the these are the positions that I have that are unclassified. Let's try to keep it classified and unclassified. We have under law uh, the mayor, secretary, and any assistance to the mayor are unclassified. Now, remember that any assistance, because that's going to be sort of the catchphrase. Does that mean 50? Does it mean one? What does that mean? Uh, number two, the city clerk and assistant city clerk. These are unclassified. Number three, the city attorney and all assistant city attorneys. And we think the reason for that is, of course, they wanted attorneys removed so they could be removed any time and not be, uh, there be no issue about them being classified. Uh, the directors of the divisions and one secretary for each director. That's your unclassified staff in the city. It's pretty simple. And, and it's not a whole lot of folks. Uh, <clears throat> the assistance part is the catch because how many assistants does any assistance mean? So here's what the legislature did. When the, all these things started happening between personnel and HR, they came back under what's called Act 390, and they said... One chief of staff, COO, this is for the city of Alexander specifically, uh, an administrative secretary to the mayor, 10 mayoral assistants. So they defined that assistance. And then they said all charter division heads. So this is what it adds up to be, Sherry. One CAO, one administrative assistant. There are 10 mayoral assistants that we're allowed under law, 10 and no more. And then the nine division heads. So that's... 21 people, right? 21 people are entitled to direct appointment by me. Nine of those have to be confirmed by council, the division heads. No one else has to be confirmed by council. Hence how we could bring on Mr. Foster the way we did. Uh, we have filled 15 people, so we're not at our capacity. Again, this needs to be made clear to the folks at home. And we have one contract employee, Mr. Juno. Uh, where, where does he fall in? Is he special staff, executive staff, or just contract? He's a contract employee. He's a contract employee. Right. He doesn't perform a service that requires him to be civil service because it's not a daily service, uh, and we think it's more appropriate as a contract uh, than bringing him on with full benefits. Mr. Juno has not benefited. His contract, when I came on, was capped. Uh, it can only be raised uh, above that cap if uh, there is a certification for a special need. Where is he currently? Uh, pull in. So. His cap is forty-five thousand uh, per year. Sorry, Ken. I know people hate to have that, but uh, that's thought, the nature of this business. Dealing with Ken, I thought it would have been more. <laughs> I understand. Uh, forty-five thousand. Uh, his cap was raised last year because of the months of October and November. And I'll, I think we all understand. I'll, I'll leave it at that. Uh, there were there were certain things that were going on in the city last year through a, that last quarter that uh, took a lot of time. And so we raised it during that period. To, to the 45? Uh, no, it, the, he, he's capped at 45. We went above the 45 because okay. he sent me a letter certifying it, and I certified that we went through. He has to show us the bills and why, and we certified that it was permissible for him to exceed. He's, he's capped per annum, and then he's also capped per month. So he had to get permission to exceed his per month cap. And that's all in the contract. It's public record. We provided it to the radio station. It was discussed on air, I think, this week uh, in, uh, extensively. Uh, Steve Coco is showing me. Um, that's correct. As far as his duties, uh, going after the documentation that, that Ken dropped on, thank you again very much. Very informative. Uh, Ken has mentioned as 